Let's pray and let's jump right in. Father, thank you so much. Thank you so much for you are a good God. You are a faithful God. I thank you for your presence in this room. When your presence shows up, everything changes. God, and your power is here. It is available to heal. I thank you, Father, that we extend our faith. We reach our faith out for a miracle. We expect miracles to take place in this room. God, we refuse to just come in and leave out the same way. We expect you to perform something supernatural, something that only you can do. Holy Spirit, have your way. Holy Spirit, move. Holy Spirit, set free, break chains, deliver. Men, broken, broken hearts. Holy Spirit, you reign and rule in this place. In Jesus' name. Everybody said amen. 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 Again, we're going to kick off our series today called Miracles, Miracles. Expect the unexpected. Here's what we believe. We believe that every single time that you come here, that something amazing will happen in your life. Not just, you know, we come in and you have a good worship service. The songs were good. By the way, my baby did absolutely amazing today. I just, I just really embarrassed her right now. But I added some points uh, for her. <laughs> And didn't she do awesome? Uh, awesome. What we expect is that, that every time you walk into this place, every time you drive on this campus, we expect and we believe and we pray that God is going to do something supernatural in your life. Whenever you come into God's house, always expect him to do something. Don't ever come into his house just flippantly and haphazardly and just come in to check off a box to say, hey, I went to church today. No, come into God's house expecting him to do something. Not just anything, but expecting God to do something that only he can get the credit for. That's what a miracle is. A miracle is not something that I can do in my own strength. A miracle is not something that I can write the check and pay for it myself. No, a miracle is that something that God, when God steps in, only he can get the credit for. No one can say, hey, if it wasn't for me, that wouldn't have happened in your life. If it wasn't for me, you wouldn't be walking anymore. If it wasn't for me, you wouldn't be healed from that. If it wasn't for me, your relationship wouldn't be restored. No, when God walks in and he does something that only he can do, that's a miracle. And that's what we believe happens here every single week. And what I want to tell you is I want to tell you that every time you walk into those doors, Every time you pull on this campus, I want you to have, we want you to have an expectation in your heart of God to do something super natural. Years ago, <clears throat> my wife and I, we were in the process of bu buying our own home. <clears throat> and uh, er, not buying our own home. <laughs> of course, it's our own home. <laughs> we were in the process of buying, um, buying our home here um, and uh, about two years ago. And we were working with the lender and, you know, all of that good stuff. And uh, I had something on my credit report uh, like years ago that it literally, it really wasn't, it wasn't my fault, Cheryl. Like it, it wasn't my fault. <laughs> Says everybody with bad credit, right? <laughs> no, no, I, 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 actually, it literally was not my fault. If, if there was something my wife and I could have done to fix it, we would have fixed it. It was just out of our control. And so there was this big thing on our credit report that just really, you know, and my credit is actually good now. Like I'm over the 700s, so I'm doing... <laughs> I'm doing pretty good. <laughs> um, so we, I, 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 we had this thing on our credit report, and I talked to, um, talked to my lender, and I told the lender, I said, hey, listen, I got this on here. I want you to know that it's there. Um, I don't know if it's going to prevent us from, you know, from getting any funding or however that works, but I just want you to know um, that this thing is there. He said, okay, no problem. I'll take a look at it, and we'll see what we can do. I said, all right, cool. So a couple of days later, he calls back. <clears throat> And he says, hey, Dave, um, the thing that you were telling me about, did you pay that off? I said, no, I didn't pay that off. He said, are you sure? I said, yeah, I'm pretty sure. that It would have taken me like five years to, to actually pay that off. Like I don't even make enough money in 10 years to pay what that thing was. No, I did not pay it off. He said, well, it shows on your credit report that it's paid in full. I was like, when I tell you, That's a miracle. It's not something, again, now, now there are some times that we put ourselves in situations 
and we're kind of suffering the consequences of it. Listen, even in those situations, God still wants to perform a miracle in your life. Don't ever feel like because you messed up so bad that God doesn't want to show up and he wants to punish you because of the decision that you made. No, God can still show up in an impossible situation and make it possible. God wants to do something. You want to know why that miracle happened in our life? Because we're tithers. Because we were faithful to put seed into the ground. Because even when our outgo... Our, our, we were in a time where our outgo tripled our income, which, again, that wasn't our fault either. Like, I'm really serious. It wasn't, <laughs> it, it was, it wasn't our fault. Even in those moments when we were trying to figure out how we were going to pay the cell phone bill, we never tried to figure out how we were going to pay our tithe. That was a non-negotiable. We're going to make sure that we always tithe. If we don't have food in the refrigerator, we're going to tithe because we know that God is our source and he's our provider and he'll always make sure that we have everything we need as long as his house is taken care of. In Malachi 3, he says, listen, if you bring the tithe into the storehouse and you make sure that my house is taken care of, you don't ever have to worry about your house, baby. I'm going to always make sure that you have every single thing that you need. Listen, that is us standing on the promise of God. And because we did that, because we have put some, some, some money in our spiritual bank account, we can put that ATM number in, that PIN number in, and make a withdrawal and say, Daddy, we need you to take care of this here. And that thing ended up being paid in full. That is a miracle. That is an expectation. When you expect God to do the unexpected, you see some amazing things happen in your life. Israel Holden wrote a song years ago. He used to say this. He said, the atmosphere of expectation is the breeding ground for miracles. When you create and cultivate an atmosphere of faith and expectation, you want to see God do something supernatural, start believing again. You want to see God do something amazing in your life, start thanking him for something that he's already done. When you create an atmosphere of expectation, it's a breeding ground for miracles. In the back, in, in, our, in our student ministries, what we've been trying to teach our students in there, my wife and I and all, uh, us other, other leaders, we've been trying to cre- treat, treat, uh, teach them this, that an atmosphere of expectation breeds miracles, so much so that we saw a miracle in our services. I'm not talking about somebody that just, you know, is like, uh, you know, um, they, their dog, their, something happened to their dog and then the dog was healed. Like, that's a miracle. Okay, of course. But I'm talking something supernatural. This young girl has been deaf her entire life, is what she told us. We created this environment that God can do something. And we've been telling them, listen, we taught us a a series on the Holy Spirit. God wants to do something in your life. God can do something in your life. If you believe it, you will see the glory of God. Can I tell you today, her, her ear is completely clear. She can hear. I remember during the, during the service, my wife was actually preaching, and she was up, and she called an altar call, and she called the students down. She says, if you want God to do a miracle in your life, I want you to come down to this altar. And they came down, and my daughter was up singing. She has an amazing voice. She's up singing, and she's worshiping. And as she was worshiping, she started to sing, come and breathe here. And at that moment, when she started to sing that song, come and breathe here, am I lying? The, the, the students, both her and her sister, ran over to me. I wasn't on the stage. They ran over to me and said, she said, Pastor Dave, I can hear out of my ear 100%. <laughs> and every week, every week I've gone back and I've asked her, I said, can you still hear? She said, yeah, it sounds weird though because I'm not used to it. I'm just trying to get used to hearing again. Listen, God wants to do some things in your life. It's, I got to get used to believing again. I got to get used to hearing again. I got to get used to all this favor that God is throwing my way. I got to get used to it again. Expect the unexpected in your life. Don't come into God's house not expecting him to do something. I believe that God's going to perform a miracle by the end of this service, that God's going to perform a miracle in someone's life today. I believe that something supernatural is going to happen in your life today. I believe it. But can you believe it? That's what we want to do. I want to build your faith up today. 
And for these next couple weeks, Pastor Don's going to bring a message uh, throughout the rest of this series. He's going, we're going to build your faith that you can begin to expect the unexpected. We want to build your faith today. We want to help strengthen that faith muscle that you've got. You know, when I was growing up, I had this mindset that I, I would say this, and you probably, probably have said this too, that I expect the worst, but I hope for the best. Anybody ever said that? Anybody ever believe that? Were you excited about that? I expect the worst, but I hope for the best. Can I tell you that's the absolutely wrong way to live? <laughs> I set you up. You, yeah. I set you up. That's horrible. That is a horrible mindset to expect the worst, but hope for the best, that you always expect bad things to happen in your life, that if something good happens, it's like, oh, well, I guess that was okay, but I expected bad things to happen. Listen, God wants you to get to a place. That's not the life that a believer should live. We should live in a place that we always expect good things to happen. Listen, I don't care how bad you've been. I don't care how many mistakes you've made. I don't care how many times you've told God that you weren't going to do it again and you fell back again. Listen, you are not too bad. You are not unworthy. You do deserve good things. You do deserve God to do something amazing in your life. You are worthy of his blessing. James chapter 1 says that every good and perfect gift comes from God. It comes down from the Father of lights. You deserve it simply because you name the name of Jesus Christ. No, you cannot do enough good things. No, you cannot sow enough. No, you cannot pray enough. No, you can't come to church enough. You can't worship enough. You can't pray for people enough. But simply because God is good and he sent Jesus into this world, you are deserving of every good and every perfect gift that comes from God. You do deserve good things. You do deserve to have the unexpected to happen in your life. Can you believe it? Can you believe it? There's a group that I was growing up with, um, the Clark sisters. Anybody know who the Clark sisters are? Everybody know the Clark sisters? I'm from Detroit, so I know the Clark sisters. They... That's, some, that's my Detroit homies. <laughs> but they had this song years ago. It's actually before I was born. Years ago. And the song would say, I'm looking for a miracle. I expect the impossible. I see the invisible. I feel the intangible. And then it says, I expect a miracle every day. God will make a way out of no way. I wonder what would happen if you and I began to expect a miracle every single day. I'm not talking about once a month. I'm not talking about one good thing a year. No, I'm talking about you're believing God to do something supernatural in your life every single day. You are expecting God. You wake up and saying, okay, God, I want to see how you're going to blow my mind today. I don't care what it may look like. I don't care what your bank account says. I don't care what your job may say. I don't care what the media says, what social media says. I don't care what your friend, your cousin on the left side of your family. I don't care what none of them say. But you wake up expecting God to perform something supernatural in your life every single day. I'm going to build your faith today. Can you believe again? Can you expect God to do the unexpected every single day? Expect the unexpected. My question for you, if you have that mindset that you expect the worst and you hope for the best, what would happen if you changed your perspective? What would happen if you began to look at life a little different? What would happen if you expected God's favor? What would happen if you expected a miracle? What would happen if you began to expect the unexpected? Because just how you can expect the unexpected in a negative way, you can expect the unexpected in a positive way by faith. I know it may not look like it, but can I tell you that the Bible tells us that we don't walk by what we see. We walk by what we believe because what I see may not line up with what I believe, 
What I see may be the facts, but I don't believe the facts. I believe the truth. I know the doctor may say something that's a fact, but I believe the truth. I know the doctor may have given you a diagnosis that says you may have cancer. It says you may have high blood pressure. It says you may have high cholesterol. It says you may have whatever you may have. I don't know what, it, what the doctor may say, but I know what the truth of God's word is. And the truth of God's word says that by his stripes, you were healed. You are healed. You live in healing. Can you believe that again? Can you believe God for the unexpected? I want to tell you a story. It's a very familiar story in the Bible. It's a story of Lazarus. Anybody know who Lazarus is? It's found in John chapter 11. And in this story of Lazarus, Jesus, I believe, as I read through this, Jesus gives us this picture of what happens when we expect him to do the unexpected. Now, Jesus, or Lazarus was, Lazarus was Jesus. He, that was his friend. That was his homeboy. Like, that was his, that was his buddy. That was his, he was part of his squad. That was his best friend, his bestie. If you call it BFF, whatever you call your, your best friend, your ace boom coon. <laughs> whatever you call your, your, your friend, your best friend. That's who Lazarus was to Jesus. And the reason I know that he was this to Jesus, because in verse, uh, uh, chapter 11, verse 3, Mary and Martha, who were his sisters, they sent word to Jesus. In verse 3, they said, Jesus, the one you love, is sick. Now, you got to be a friend for them to not have to mention your name. They just say, Jesus, the one you love, is sick. And automatically, Jesus knows exactly who you're talking about. And it's, it's weird because... The person who wrote, this, who wrote this account in the Bible, in the Gospel of John, is the person who doesn't even refer to himself. He doesn't even say his own name in his own writing. You know what he says about himself? The disciple whom Jesus loved. Like, you got to be an arrogant some, somebody to say, you don't even say your name. It's just like, I'm the disciple that Jesus loved. You know who I am? Put some respect on my name. What would happen if you had that same thought process? That you looked in the mirror and you saw yourself as the son whom Jesus loves. That no matter what you've experienced in your life, no matter what a trauma you've experienced, no matter what bad thing, that you look in the mirror and you say, I'm still the daughter that Jesus loved. Can you look in the mirror and call yourself the one whom Jesus loves? Mary and Martha said, Jesus, I almost knocked that water over. That would have been bad because this is my wife's iPad. She would have killed me. <laughs> Mary and Martha look at, they send this word to Jesus and they say, You're the one you love, Jesus, is sick. You know, the interesting thing about this is when Lazarus was experiencing a very traumatic time in his life, Mary and Martha didn't just go and talk to anybody. Mary and Martha went to the one who could actually change the situation. You got to be careful who you talk to when you're going through a bad moment in your life. You got to be careful who you talk to, who you surround yourself with when you're experiencing a major issue in your life. You got to know the right person to go to. You got to know the right person to talk to. Stop going to your coworker. Stop going to your friend that y'all been friends for 30 years because every single time you tell them something, they never give you any encouragement. They always pull you down. I said this first service. Stop talking to every John, Jacob, Jingleheimer, and Schmidt. <laughs> Stop talking to every time, Dick and Harry. Stop, whatever you want to say. Stop talking to anyone who cannot change the situation that you're in. Mary and Martha had an inkling to know that this, my brother is going through a, a very bad situation. I need to go to the person who can change it. You need to go to Jesus. What a friend we have in Jesus. All our strengths to bear. What a privilege it is to carry everything to God in prayer. You got to know who your friend is. You've got a friend in the Holy Spirit. You've got a friend in Jesus. Now, Jesus' response was interesting to me. When he found out that his friend was sick, when he found out that his friend was going through 
a very bad situation in his life. Verse six tells us, when he heard that Lazarus was sick, watch this, he stayed where he was two more days. Really, Jesus? Like my problem is not good enough for you to move right now? Like you got to wait a couple more days? No, Jesus, I need you right now. You know, the old folks, oh, see, I did it again. <laughs> If you're an old folk, after I say this, I'm sorry. I ain't really calling you old folk. I'm just, my wife said to say season. The season, saints. <laughs> Thank you, baby. It's, she always helped me out. Yeah. That's my help meet for a reason. <laughs> the season, saints, used to say that he may not come when you want him, but he's always on time. But sometimes, Jesus, I need you to come when I want you. I don't need you to wait. Sometimes, have you ever been in that place where you've prayed and you asked for Jesus and it feels like he doesn't come right when you want him? It feels like he's taking this sweet little time to show up. But sometimes, Jesus, I need you to come when I want you to come. But what you got to see here is Jesus waited. And Jesus waited for a reason. And I believe the reason that Jesus waited was because Jesus knew a little something that the disciples, that Mary, that Martha didn't know. Jesus knew that something was going to happen. If you look at verse 4, we're going to take a step back to verse 4. It says, when he heard this, Jesus said, this sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory so that God's son may be glorified through it. What Jesus was doing was Jesus was creating an atmosphere of expectation. Jesus was letting them know, hey, listen, you haven't heard that Lazarus is dead yet, but I know that he's already dead. And so I want to create this atmosphere so that you can expect that something is amazing is going to happen. This sickness is not going to end in death. And what I want to tell you is that whatever you may be experiencing in your life, that relationship, it's not going to end in death. If you can create this atmosphere of faith and expectation, you can see the glory of God. It's not going to end in death death, whatever sickness you might have on your life, that depression that you might be experiencing, that anxiety that you may be experiencing and going through, the fear that keeps rising up on the inside of you, it's not going to end in death. If you can believe again, can you believe again? Can you expect the unexpected? Jesus says, the sickness is not going to end in death. The reason that Jesus, Jesus waited was because Jesus knows. He knows what you're going through. He knows what you're experiencing. And the problem that we have sometimes is we think that Jesus doesn't know. Can he see that I'm experiencing this hard time in my life? Can he see all of the tears that I cry every single night that nobody knows about? Can you see the, the, the times that I wake up and I have, I'm so depressed and it feels like I can't even pull myself out of bed? Can he see what I'm going through? Can he see that last night my spouse slept on the couch because we're not having a good time right now? We're not in a good place. Can he see that? Can he see the diagnosis that I just got? Does Jesus know? Can I tell you that Jesus sees, Jesus knows He's aware of what you're going through. So he tells the disciples, Lazarus is sleeping. One of the disciples responds and say, well, Jesus, if he's sleeping, why don't we just let him sleep? If, that's where, if he's sick, he, probably, he just needs some sleep. Sleep heals everything. And all the people that love sleep say, amen. <laughs> My wife is one. She just absolutely loves sleep. I feel like I'm wasting time. The only time I can take a nap is on Sunday. Them Sunday naps, Jesus. <laughs> Woo. You want to talk like feeling like you just stepped into heaven. It's them Sunday naps. Boy, I tell you. <laughs> Try it. I promise you. <laughs> if he's asleep, Jesus, why don't we just let him sleep? Jesus said in verse 21, or oh, I'm sorry, in verse 11 or 14. So then he told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. But watch this. And for your sake, I'm glad that I was not there so that you might believe. I want to tell you 
that in those moments where you feel like you're praying and you're asking God to show up and he doesn't show up right away, sometimes for our sake, it's good that Jesus doesn't show up right when we want him to show up so that we might believe. Because sometimes we just have to work on our faith. Sometimes we just have to grow and strengthen that faith muscle that we have on the inside of us. Sometimes we just have to believe again. Can you believe again? Can you expect the unexpected? So Jesus said, for your sake, I'm glad that I was that I wasn't there so that you might believe, but let us go to him. And then Thomas, say, oh, Thomas. Thomas said to the disciples, let us also go that we might die with him. Thomas is so negative. <laughs> now, you might read that and you might get something else, but I see negativity all over this because I know a little something about Thomas. This is the same Thomas that said, I don't care what y'all said. I know y'all saw him, but I don't believe that he actually came back until I put my finger in his hand and my finger on his side. Like, I ain't believing none of that. Y'all can miss me with that. Like, I got to see this for myself. That, that Thomas. People call him Doubting Thomas. Do you have those people in your life that they're just so negative all the time? Like you hate asking them, how you doing today? Because you better get ready for a two-hour story. And every bit of the story is going to be negative. And it's like, dang, I shouldn't even, I got, I got to be somewhere in 10 minutes. And like you start, you start saying that preempting the conversation. They be like, hey, can I talk to you? Yeah, but I got a meeting in like three minutes, so can we... <laughs> Like you just want, you started off by saying that just so you know it could kind of speed up a little bit. And you hate asking those people like, are you okay? Is, how, how's everything going today? <sighs> Isn't that how it start? Am I lying? It's, <sighs> that deep sigh and it's like, oh man. If you're that person or that person sitting next to you, just keep looking straight. <laughs> just keep looking right here. Don't say anything. Just smile like nothing's going wrong. Thomas said, let us go that we may die with him. So they go on this journey to Bethany. And when they get to Bethany, they're standing on the outside of the city. Martha hears that Jesus is coming. And Martha runs out to the end of the edge of the city. And she gets to Jesus. And in verse 21, she says, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Martha is in this place of pain. Martha is in this place of frustration because she knows what Jesus can do. She knows the miracles that he can perform. She's seen it happen before. And she begins to blame Jesus, I feel, for not showing up when she needed him to show up. How often in your life have you blamed Jesus? Have you blamed God for not showing up when you needed him to show up? God, if you had been here, my marriage wouldn't have ended. God, if you had been here, my loved one wouldn't have died. God, if you had been here, if you had showed up when I needed you to show up, I wouldn't be depressed. I wouldn't be anxious. I wouldn't have fear. I wouldn't have trust issues. I wouldn't be, have low self-esteem. If you had just showed up when I needed you to show up, can I tell you that God's okay when you blame him? God's not afraid of your humanity. God's not afraid of your anger. He's not afraid of your questions. He's not afraid of any of that. God isn't afraid of it. Even Jesus had a moment of humanity. In the Garden of Gethsemane, he's praying and he's getting ready to, to endure one of the hardest things that he's ever experienced in his life. And he gets to this moment. He knows why he was sent here to the earth. He knows why he was here. He knows his plan or the, God's plan. He knows the will for God in his life. And he says, God, I don't want to do this. I don't want to do this. I don't want to give up my life. I don't want to do this. He had a moment of humanity. And then his spirit kicked back up and he said, but nevertheless, Father, it's not about my will but it's about your will being done. Can I tell you, it's okay, okay to not be okay. It's okay to cry sometimes. It's okay to blame God in moments and saying, God, I don't want to keep going through this. 
God, I don't want to keep enduring this. God, I don't want to have this pain anymore. God, I don't want to have this struggle anymore. I don't want to have this weakness anymore. It's okay to have those moments of humanity. But can you believe again that God can do the unexpected in your life? Can you believe that God can do something supernatural? Now watch this. Mary, Martha had this moment of, of, of humanity and then she turns around and has a faith response. And she says, but I know that even now, God will give you whatever you ask. Sometimes we need an even now experience in our life. I know that I've been dealing with this for so long, God, but even now, I know you can perform a miracle. I've been dealing with this trauma and this stress and this, this, all of this stuff for so very, for years and years and years, but even now, I know that you can perform a miracle. I know the divorce papers have already gone in. I know they've already come back and we're getting ready to sign, but God, even now, I know. Do you know that God can restore a marriage? Do you believe that? If God can change the heart of a Pharaoh. Now, granted, he put some plagues on that. Don't pray no plagues on your spouse. And then, <laughs> don't, don't pray, don't, God, I pray that when he, when he pours that water, it comes, the blood comes into that cup, Jesus. Don't pray that. That, that's, that, that ain't going to work. I'm just telling you. God, I pray when he opens up his car, that you just, just frogs just everywhere. Just, it's not going to happen. I'm just... God can perform a miracle if you expect the unexpected. Even now, she says, I know, Jesus, that God will give you whatever you ask. And Jesus responded to her and said, Martha, your brother will rise again. So you see Martha's response. And then you see Mary's response. Now, Mary said the same thing that Martha said. But what I want you to see is I want you to see the difference in how Mary approached Jesus. Mary comes up in verse 32, and it says, when Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet. Do you notice how her posture was different when she approached Jesus? This is the same Mary that broke perfume and washed and anointed Jesus' feet with her hair. This is the same Mary that worshiped him with everything that she had. She runs to him and she falls to his feet and at, in worship and she says, Jesus, Lord, if you were here, my brother wouldn't have died. Now watch what this posture caused Jesus to do, the response that Jesus had because of her worship to him. It says, when Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping. He was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Now we're starting to see a different side of Jesus. We're starting to see a side of Jesus of emotion. And in John eleven thirty five, 35, and I'm move really fast. It says that Jesus wept. It's the shortest scripture in, in, in the Bible. But I believe it's one of the most powerful. Because we see not only does Jesus know what you're going through and experiencing in your life. But what you need to know is that Jesus cares. That he actually cares. It's one thing to know. It's another thing to actually cares. Jesus wept because he cares. He cared about Lazarus. He cared about Martha and Mary. He cared about the other Jews. And he cares about you. He cares what you're going through. He cares what you're experiencing, the pain. He cares about it. He cares about you. But sometimes we struggle with if we're important enough or good enough for him not only to know what we're experiencing, but to actually care. In Hebrews chapter 4, it says that we have a high priest that sympathizes with our weaknesses. He knows what we're going through. He knows the struggles that you're having. He knows he's not just some God that's sitting up on a throne and not caring about what's going on in your life. He cares about every detail of your life. And not only does, do you want a miracle, but he wants to perform a miracle in your life. Can you believe again? 
Jesus knows. Jesus cares. The last thing I want you to know is that Jesus wins. And the reason that Jesus wins, because he's able. He's able. I don't know what you're experiencing in your life, but I want you to know that Jesus is able to perform a miracle in your life. In verse 39, he says, take away the stone. He says, take away the stone. But Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man, by this time, he'd been dead for too long, Jesus. Jesus said, did I not tell you, look at this, verse 40, that if you believe, you will see the glory of God. Can I tell you that if you believe, if you believe, you can see the glory of God in your life. So they took away the stone. Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you've heard me. He says this prayer. And when he finishes this prayer, I'm moving fast. He said, when he said this, Jesus called out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man comes out, his hands, feet wrapped with strips of linen and cloth around his face. He still looked dead. But a miracle was just performed. The unexpected happened. The unexpected happened because there was an expectation that was set. Jesus knows, he cares, and he's able. When you create an atmosphere of expectation, the team can come on the stage. You're setting that environment up for a miracle. When you create an atmosphere of expectation, you are setting your environment up for a miracle. I want to tell you a quick story before we go. About 12 years ago, 12, 13 years ago, my aunt, my mother's sister, she, uh, well, prior to that, she had been diagnosed with breast cancer. Gone through chemo, whole nine, she lost her hair. Just, it was, you know, it got really bad for her. And in one moment, she got sick and she got pneumonia. And for those of you that know, if you have, if you have chemo, it, you know, uh, diminishes, suppresses your immune system. So anything that hits your body, it hits your body like 10 times worse. So she gets pneumonia and overnight she went from being aware to out, just like that. And she's in this moment in the hospital. My mom calls me, we were living in Charlotte, North Carolina at the time. My mom calls me and she says, David, I think you need to get home. Your auntie Shannon is not doing good. And she didn't give me the full details. She just told me, you need to come home. She's not doing good. So I get on a plane and I go home. And as I'm going, there was a faith on the inside of me. Now, I hadn't gotten there yet. I didn't know how bad it was. I just knew that I needed to get home. But there was something on the inside of me that said, this sickness is not going to end in death. There was something on the inside of me that said, God is going to perform a miracle. I believe it. So I brought this, this CD of Pastor Hagen, this healing scriptures. And I told my mom, I said, hey, I need you to make sure that there's a radio there. When I get there, I need you to make sure that there's a radio there. She said, okay, she made sure. I get to the hospital, long story short, I get to the hospital, I walk in the room and people are crying and all of that stuff. And I asked my mom, I said, I need you to ask everybody to leave. Now my mom is the oldest sibling, so she pretty much is in control of everything. So she says, hey, everybody, I need y'all to leave. They leave out and I'm sitting there with my mom and I'm talking to her and I said, mom, if we're gonna see a miracle happen, we have to create an environment of faith. We can't have unbelief in this room. We can't have negativity in this room. We have to create an environment of faith. You know, there was a story in the Bible when Jesus walked into a room and he was going to heal this, one, this little girl and he asked everyone, clear the room because Jesus had to clear the room of unbelief. He had to clear the room of anything that will prevent this miracle from happening in the life of this little girl. And so I told my mom, I said, we've got to get this room clear. She clears it out and I said, we cannot allow anyone in here who's going to be in unbelief. We can't have any tears. We can't have any negativity. We can only have faith and expectation for God to do something. She said, okay, son, you're right. My mom, she's a very strong woman. People would come in the room and they would come in and they're crying and they would come, goodbye, Shannon. She's like, nope, uh-uh, we're not having that. Get out. Get out. And she would literally kick them out the room. 
You're not coming in here to say your goodbyes. That's not what we're doing. Get out of here. And she cleared the room of anyone who had that kind of mentality, that mindset, that it was over. The doctor comes and says, hey, we need you to bring your family together. And I want to show you this picture of my aunt. This was her in the hospital. When I showed up, that's what I saw. That's the picture that I saw. My lively aunt, this is what I saw. So the doctor tells us to come into the room, the whole family, and we're all sitting around in a circle. And he says, I want, you, I want to tell y'all, we've done everything that we can. We tried to give her medication. Her body's not responding anymore. She's actually in septic shock and her organs are starting to shut down. There's nothing else we can do. She's literally only living by the machine. If we turn the machine off, she's going to die. There's nothing else we can do. And I don't want to say she has 0% chance to live, so I'll say she has less than 1% chance to live. What do you guys want to do? My mom looks at me, and I said, well, if there's nothing else that you can do, and she only has less than 1% chance to live, then there's still a chance. Let's let her keep stay on the machine, and we'll see what happens in the morning. My mom said, that's what we're going to do. The doctor said, are you sure? She said, yes, we are. He said, okay, well, I'll be back to check on you guys in the morning. He walks out. We started praying and believing God. And we didn't start praying and begging God. We didn't start praying and crying and saying, God, can you please do this? Can you please help us out? Can you please show up? No. Because when you know who you are and you know the God that you serve, you don't have to beg him for anything. You thank him for what he's already done. So we started thanking him for the healing that already took place. Even though we don't see it, God, we know that you're working. Even though we don't feel it, we know that you're moving. And I, I know what it may look like, and I know what the doctors may say, but God, we believe that you can and that you are and that you will perform a miracle in her life. Amen. Morning comes. The doctor gets there. He walks in the room, does some stuff. He checks around. He walks out. Comes back in the room and he checks again, gets some more people. He talks to my mom. He says, I don't know what happened over the night, but something happened and now her body is starting to change. Her body's starting to respond to the medication. He didn't know what happened, but we knew what happened. God showed up because we expected him to do the unexpected and miracle signs and wonders can follow you too because you believe. Can you believe again? That was 12 years ago. This is my aunt now. <laughs> Hallelujah! The same God that did it for us is the same God that can do it for you. If you can believe it, can you believe that you can see the glory of God? Can you believe that God can do the unexpected in your life? Can you believe somebody give God a shout of praise that only he deserves? God, you're so worthy. You're so awesome. Can you believe again? Can you expect the unexpected? What I want to know, I want to know how many people can come in here every single week and believe God to do something supernatural in your life. Can you believe it? Here in this room online, can you believe that God can do the unexpected in your life? Not only does God want to perform a miracle in your life, but God wants to perform a miracle through your life.
He don't just want to heal you. Don't be selfish. He wants you to lay hands on the sick and see them recover. He wants you to speak to dead people. He wants you to tell, take that stone away. Lazarus, come out. He wants you to speak to dead things and dead relationships and watch it come back to life. He wants to see. He wants to do those things for you. These signs shall follow those who believe. Can you believe again? The signs follow you. It's kind of like that Peter anointing. I want that Peter anointing. That when I walk by, I don't even have to lay hands on you, but my presence, and it ain't got nothing to do with me, but it's the greater one on the inside of me that people get healed by my shadow. I walk through Walmart and somebody's dealing with depression and instantly they just get an ounce, a dose of joy because they came in contact with the spirit of the living God on the inside of me. Can you believe again?